groups were enemies leading Moses to forbid any Moabite from entering the assembly of the Lord and states there that's a verse from Deuteronomy nevertheless Ruth moved to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law and found the man of her dreams the short book of Ruth has the story and if you know anything from the story uh, Ruth and Boaz now if I can remember correctly either the grandparents or the great-grandparents of King David sometimes love goes beyond our normal boundaries and we find it overseas <laughs> so, so with that in mind we're going to look at the book of 2nd John now it's not too often you could say in a service you're going to study a whole book of a Bible of the Bible but today God willing we will be able to second John is one of what's called a postcard epistle for those who are a bit older you would obviously know what a postcard is for those who are younger postcard was a very short letter and sent in the mail and small enough to be placed on one little card and that's what we have here a very short letter along with there's three others in the Bible we've got Philemon third John and Jude so we have second John so short if you got your Bibles there you could probably see how short it is what why on earth is it sitting in our Bible what's so important about it <clears throat> so second John provides information about the enemies of the truth we are warned against how we deal with false teachers doing the right the wrong thing could actually be something that you're doing and it can change the way that people view you as a believer does that sound important yes. yeah certainly does so who wrote the book if you look through second John you won't find anybody's name sitting there about who the author is so it is by church tradition that we know that this was written by John the Apostle John we'll get on to what's on the screen there shortly so from the second century onwards it was known to be written by John this letter along with third John he calls himself the elder and we'll get to and have a closer look at that shortly John we also have the gospel of John written by him first second third John written by him and probably the most famous book Revelation and you'll find very similar ways that he writes about things in all of those except for in Revelation because that wasn't his writing he was writing down what he was told directly from Jesus Christ this was one of the later books that were written they were written even after all of the letters by Paul the Apostle Paul and maybe written around the period of AD 85 through to 95 in that period so could even be as much as 10 years after Paul had already died what do we know about John now I've got some things on the screen there so we could read through them pretty quickly so and we're not going to go through all the Bible passages you can if you wanted to uh, have a look at those later for yourself his mother was Salome is a cousin of Jesus 
His father was Zebedee, who was a fisherman, brother of at least James. We don't know how many other siblings he had. James and John together were known as the Sons of Thunder. Could be due to their personality, a bit fiery. So if you read through the Gospels, you can read accounts of that. Uh, the disciple, and if you read through the book of John, he actually calls himself uh, the beloved of Jesus. So the, Jesus loved John. And he was part of the inner circle. Along with, I'm just going to make sure, normally I remember these things, Peter and James. Whew, got it. <laughs> he was also bore the brunt of the, the uh, hostility of the Jewish people in the early days. He was known as a pillar of the church. And of course, we all know him as being exiled to Patmos. And we can read of that in, obviously, Revelation. He came from a wealthy family. We could read of... Uh, there were servants helping with the fishing. In order to have servants, you had to have money to pay for them. And interestingly, he may have been a disciple of John the Baptist. Some other things. His birthplace, uh, the northern part of the, um, just north of the Sea of Galilee in Bethsaida. He was obviously Jewish. Education. In the book of Acts, you could read this for yourself, Acts chapter 14, it says that he was unlearned, which simply in the day meant that he did not go to rabbinical school. He would have gone through the normal education process. And if you know anything about the education process in that northern area of Galilee, he, by our standards, when it came to what we know as the Old Testament, was very edu well educated. I'm sure if you asked him any verse in the Old Testament, he would be able to recite it for you. Very well educated. Very knowledgeable in the Torah. His death was said that he died in the city of Ephesus soon after writing Revelation and probably would have been around 100 years old. Hopefully Kobe got that name, Ephesus. <laughs> he didn't. Name one of the cities for you, Kobe. <laughs> He's taking notes. <laughs> and his character, we know him as maybe having a fiery temper. If we read through the Gospels, uh, we could also read of his intensity when it came to his relationship with Christ. His intensity when it came to evil and the deeds around it. And he loved to call people my little children. And that gives you an idea of what he thought about other believers, that he was there to nurture those people. And that's what we find in this letter. Now, whenever you're studying a book of the Bible, one of the first things you like to do is get an idea of how this book is split up. Being short, it's very easy to work this out. So verse 1 to 3 is talking about the truth. 4 to 6, commandment. And these are words, when you go through these sections, you will find those words standing out. Verse 7 to 11, it's about teaching, discipleship. And the last two verses, his farewell message. As you go through, some of the words that stood out to me when I was looking, looking at this book, the name of God or Christ, short book, occurs seven times. Truth, 
five times. Commandment, four times. Love, doctrine, children. And then the other two words that stood out to me were deceivers and abide. And we'll have a look at all of these as we go through this. But from those words, you can start to get an idea of what John covers off in this short letter. Truth, commandment, and love. So, let's have a look. Now, I haven't got a fancy uh, PowerPoint for us. I'm just, what I've got on the screen is just the words straight from the Bible, and I've underlined a few words for us. So, this is King James Version. I'll be reading the New King James, so we'll see some of the differences and we'll look at those as we go through. So for those who don't have a Bible or you're tired of getting a sore neck looking down, you can look up <laughs> for a bit. <laughs> Let's look at first two verses. To the, oh sorry, the elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. So the first thing we want to look at is the elder. Now this could refer to his age. Could also refer to his rank as being an elder. He was known of as being an elder in the early church also an elder in the church of Ephesus. And being elder could also refer he was older than other people. So, likely he was referring to his age, as by this time he was the last remaining apostle and he was getting up in years. John uh, okay, so let's, sorry, let's move on to the next word, to the elect lady. Elect simply refers to being picked out or chosen, a chosen lady. So we have here an unknown Christian woman, and this is the letter sent from John to her. No names mentioned. And who else? Her children. And this actually refers to her natural born children. Her natural children. So living still at home or close by at least. So here we have a letter from John the Apostle written to a lady and her children. Now there are some scholars that would say that when this talks about the lady, it talks about the church. And children talks about the believers in the church. Now, I'm not sure on that, because when I read that, I just read a lady and her children. We don't, to me, I don't want to expand that anymore. Why can't it just be to, the, to this lady, this beautiful lady and her children? There's also speculation on who the lady was. Now, you may know of Chuck Misler. He actually, he's one of those people who speculated that this was actually Mary. So which, when you read through that and the enforcement behind his letter, you could probably understand why he was so strong about some of the things that are in the letter. Make your own decision on that one. I'm just taking it as a lady, a special lady, and her children. Now, can you imagine how important this lady felt? Here was John writing this letter to you. An apostle, the last remaining apostle at that. There's no husband mentioned. So maybe by now she was a widow. 
Can you imagine how society would have treated her? You needed the man there to provide for the household. He wasn't there anymore, as far as we know. And a widow was frowned upon. They had to gain support in order to live normally. But here was this man of God writing this letter, great respect shown to her and encouragement to the elect lady and her children whom I love the agape love this is the love that a parent has toward a child and love in truth our next wonderful word a noun this is it truth signifies reality especially when it comes to our doctrine that is the truth of what we stand by so the context here would actually refer us back to the gospel the gospel is the truth the gospel that we find here not somebody else's gospel in the day there were many gospel messages going around even the romans had a gospel message but this is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this lady must have had some fantastic witness. As it wasn't just John who commended her, but it is all those who have known the truth. You noticed it was love and truth truth is the most important out of those two my relationship with my wife was built on truth first the truth of the gospel message first love came later that's what this is about truth and then love comes from that So why do they acknowledge this lady and her children? It's simply, as it states in verse 2, simply because the truth abides in us. Abiding is about taking place. So this is a common truth between John, the lady, the children and the other people. The truth, the truth that abides in each one of them. So this is that fellowship that each believer in the Lord Jesus Christ can have. When you turn up at a church for the first time, if there's no truth there, you do not want to stay. There's no love between you and them. But when you know the gospel and understand it, the message of the truth brings you together immediately. Have you ever noticed that, ha that you cannot have a deep relationship with somebody who doesn't know the truth when you know the truth? can't do it I have friends and colleagues from work and it's great to spend time with them but that deepness of relationship is just not there and when you know and understand the gospel there is a love that's there so it's nice to be with you all today <laughs> And I was thinking, when I was going over this again, I was thinking of, we had some visitors last week. And the commonality between us all was the truth of the gospel message. First time they showed up. And it just felt as if they were at home. And in their response to us, it felt as if they were at home as well. And we look forward to seeing them again next week, God willing. 
But when it comes to truth, have you ever noticed that for ex as an example, you get a group of people who are divorced. My parents are divorced, so I'm speaking from my own experience. The truth is biased immediately because of your experience. So you gain truth, what you think is truth, from experience, not from what should be the Word of God. Focus on the Word of God for gaining truth. Truth outlasts lies and deceptions. And it doesn't matter even if you vote in a corrupt government, they may think they're making a new truth. No, they're not. The truth is always found in the Word of God. It doesn't change. Truth will always stand. And even as Jesus said, John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And when laws are based on God's Word, the truth, there is something fantastic, something pure about it. People don't like it. Now, the last word there, forever. How long does the truth abide for, live for? Forever. Something we have to look forward to. It doesn't change. Even if they will try to take away the word of God, the truth does not change. Now, going on to verse 3, Grace, mercy and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Now this here, it's actually a normal greeting that they use, but it, in it, there's something special. Grace, mercy and peace. Because of the truth that is in this lady, John wants and ensures that these things, these sacred three elements, are demonstrated on her and through her. And of course, these come from two sources, the Father and the Son. Okay, grace. When I was a young Christian, I was told, what is grace? And they used this wonderful phrase, God's riches at Christ's expense. Doesn't mean a thing to me. I never understood what grace was, even though they said this time and time again. It's so simple, but no, that meant nothing. Grace. It is giving something to, to a person that they don't deserve. God has given you as a believer eternal life. You don't deserve that. And the other side of it is mercy. You'll often see in movies these people groveling at the feet of a king. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. It's not about grace. It's having mercy. Mercy is different to grace. Mercy Withhold my punishment, please. Mercy takes you so far, but you need grace to go with it, to take you the extra step. Yeah. says, God's riches at Christ's expense. To me, that explains that word completely. Oh, um, good. God's riches at Christ's expense. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah, so the expense, it cost Christ, Jesus Christ, his life. But he rose to show that the redemption was paid. Everything was paid in full. And of course, he had to ascend to heaven. So the next word in our phrase here, peace talks about a harmonious relationship. There's no problems in the relationship. And this is a peace that is both physically and spiritually.
Without showing grace and mercy, you cannot have peace. Okay, in your own life, you cannot have peace with another person without showing grace and mercy. How can you do it? We all think it's easy. Just will it in your mind. No, it doesn't work. Seems to be the catchphrase now. But no, some people you cannot have, cannot show grace to, you cannot show mercy to. There's something still holding you back and it's only through Jesus Christ that you can demonstrate a full grace and mercy to those people. When you know and understand the gospel message, then you will have grace and mercy even in your own life. And, of course, peace with God comes from that. Truth is that binding factor. The truth that you find in the Word of God brings the gospel message to you. Now, we move on to verse 4, and six, four through to 6. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. So let's just look at that verse 4, four uh, to start with. John had great rejoicing at hearing the news. Congratulations, lady and your children. Your children are following Christ. In this case, the children is not only referring to natural born children, but it's also figurative children. And the word some, you notice in the King James Version, doesn't appear there. It appears in the New King James. I have that I found of thy children walking in truth. I rejoice greatly because I found your children walking in truth. Now, as a parent, you look back, you look at your children. There is no more special joy than to see your children walk with God, to follow him without you saying a thing. They will prompt you, maybe. They will lead Bible study or something special that you have never prompted them, prompted them to do. That's what's happened here. This lady, her children are following the truth. They are walking, walking. This is not a run. This is a progressive walk day by day by day. Running, you go flat out and then you get worn out. <laughs> and then walking, it's day by day and you will beat somebody who's running. Living a Christian life. As a parent, yes, wonderful if that was to occur. Times I see it now, be so much more joy when I see it fully. So what this lady is doing, she is actually fulfilling the great command that we read of in Matthew 28. It says, Go ye therefore and teach nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. What's she doing? For her children to follow, they must learn. Who do they learn from? Very likely her. So your own children, where do they learn from? From you as a parent. Doesn't matter how young or old you are, you still have opportunities for teaching. 
your children doesn't have to be physical children, remember, spiritual children as well. So truth walks, it travels. You discover truth. Truth has always been there. Today, they're always thinking they've discovered a new truth, but the truth has always been there. It's like when they discovered gravity. How many years had gravity already been there? It was the truth. It was always there. Remember, the truth that you learn must be based on the Word of God. If that's not what you've learnt, you need to refocus. Turn yourself over to God and His Word. And the question is, how well do you know the truth? This. I heard just this morning somebody who didn't even know the story of Joseph. Joseph is found in the truth. It is such a well-known story, I was just shocked. Not surprised though. That particular person doesn't know the truth. How can you know God and say you don't know the truth? You can't. It's a very simple process. Pick up the Bible and read it. And God will reveal his truth to you. Pick it up, read it and study it. Enjoy it. There is so much truth in there. So of course, commandment. To know the truth is a command. This is the same word we could read of. Verse 4, 5 and 6. Commandment. When you command somebody, it's not an option. To follow the truth is something we should be doing. And it's not just in this letter that John writes about following the truth. It's in all of his letters. Regularly it's mentioned. And of course, we could tie this back to what we know as the Ten Commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Interesting, that one. We tend to think that this is all about swearing. Yes, that's true. I was reading recently uh, that the concept could be very much about being a follower of Christ. By being a follower of Christ, you take on the name of God. And what happens when you don't follow God? You are now using God's name in vain. You say one thing but do another. Something that is contrary to the truth. And of course, the non-believers will look at you and they will not believe a word you say. You are now turning people away from God. And people would ridicule God because of your witness. So the challenge, know the truth. And of course, John says, this is a command. As a believer, you need to do it. So it's not a, that's not a polite request. Now we go on to verse five. And we have a polite request this time. <laughs> and now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning that we love one another. Now this is the polite request, the polite version of it. 
It refers back to the command, but it's so simple. Love one another. When you know the truth, the love should flow easily. Now it's talking about the, from the beginning, this command of love one another. How long has it been there? It's actually recorded in the Old Testament. Leviticus, Leviticus 19 verse 18. Someone might beat me to it. <laughs> Leviticus 19 and verse 18. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord, it says. And of course, the more well-known passage in John, same name, same author. John 13 this time. Jesus has been asked a question. John 13 and verse 34 and 35. Well, it reads here, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. This is a command, a pleading to love one another. And how much we have seen that in years gone by here. Love one another. The love left because people forgot the truth. Now, verse 6. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Okay, love. John says, this is love. Tells us what it is now. That we walk according to his commandments. Now that's pretty simple, isn't it? His truth, that we walk according to it. And that is love. Strange, you walk to commandments. But God gave us those commandments out of love. So that we can follow him. He know, he's given his standard of what he expects from us. Out of love, when you discipline your children, you do it out of love. Because this is the standard you expect. What is it? This is love. Walk. There's our word again. Walk. Action. Steady progress. Once again. Walk. And this is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning you should walk in it. I want to take us back to Matthew this time. Matthew 22. Matthew 22, and look at, just read through verse 36 through to 40. It reads, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
fantastic words by Jesus. He challenges those people that out of all the commandments, this, these are the most important. When you do these, everything else is so much easier. When you love who? God. Love your enemies, love your friends, love your neighbour. Wow. Everything falls into place. Love is obedience. When you obey God, it shows your love to him. However, it's pointless without faith. You cannot love God without faith. When I started going to a Bible study before I was a Christian, I was told the way of salvation was to love God. Love God. Sounds great, doesn't it? No, it's not right. I had no relationship with God. There was no faith. It was so sad when I look back at what I was told that they thought I was saved. I was good in their eyes. I was doing the right thing. And every night I used to try to convince God that I loved him. I would pray, so I thought. God, I love you. Trying to convince him. No, never did. He knew. And it was years later when I found that was wrong. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Do you recall what you learnt from the beginning of your own salvation? What it was like. I still remember it was about quarter to one in the morning and it was, I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive me for my sins to accept me into his family. No more did I have to convince him that I loved him. The gospel message is so simple and yet for some reason people ignore it. I want us to have a quick look at what simply what the gospel message is. Do you remember this? Do you remember back to the days of your, just after you were saved? The gospel message was so simple. There was nothing more. It was just this. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. And starting at verse 1, we've got a fantastic definition of what the gospel message is. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, according to the truth, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. When I look back, do you recall the day of your own salvation? And I, for me, what I felt was the, it was just can't be explained. It was something just fantastic. Life was so different. Do you remember? That's what goes on 
we've got this table down the front and it says in remembrance of me that's what Christ has says do this in remembrance how often do you remember what Christ has done for you we sit around the Lord's table once a month I hope you remember more often than that can you imagine remembering every single morning what it was like on that first day of salvation in the Jewish culture remembrance is so important a lot of their festivals their feasts that they have are all about remembering remember 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 it's something that we probably don't do often enough remember what Christ has done and if you notice in your salvation were there rules faith nothing about rules faith it's not about where you sit it's not about are you noisy it's not about how you smell it's not about how much you sweat and the resultant smell that comes from it <laughs> remember it's faith and faith alone don't add to faith your rules your thoughts it's God's truth the faith okay hopefully we'll get through this we're moving on to verse 7 all right up to date on the screen for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh and this is a deceiver and an antichrist you'll notice there's a big change in the way that John is writing this now he's teaching them so in that day what was going on was there were very few people when they went out into places like even like Corinth and Ephesus the only people who knew the word of God weren't the locals, the Gentiles. They didn't know it. So they had to rely on people who, uh, particularly traveling people, who would go and share the word of God. And of course, you would get the good and the bad and the ugly. We have a description here of who were false what do they do they do not they do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh so this is some evidence of those who do not follow Jesus Christ they cannot confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh died for your sins rose again and ascended to heaven it's not about believing in a God there are many who believe God that there is a God that's not what it's about some people will believe that Jesus was a prophet or maybe he was just a good man they cannot accept that he was the Messiah they will be close by saying he's a prophet but there's so much more then they will add rules to the truth these are things you must do you must go to church you must go to Bible study you must be baptized no none of those things they will bring accusations against Jesus Christ against our Lord Jesus Christ I should say if you cannot accept Jesus is the Christ the Messiah 
the Son of the living God who has died, rose again and ascended on high and is preparing a place for us, then, sorry, you are not saved. This is not about a God. This is about our Lord Jesus Christ. Truth has to be matched against the Word of God. When it doesn't match and doesn't stand up against the Word of God, it is not truth. And it doesn't take an expert to believe in what the Word of God says. You do not have to have an IQ or very high IQ. It doesn't matter. People will ignore parts of the Bible, but you cannot do that. You have to accept the Bible in its entirety. Truth can only be matched up against God's Word. Somebody who is against God, who is an antichrist, there are things in God's word they cannot accept. But for me, when I read it, if I read God made the world in seven days, six, and the seventh day was what was called a rest, I believe it. If there was a virgin conception, I believe it. If the waters of the Red Sea were parted, I believe it. If there is something there you do not believe, then you do not follow the truth. And John calls these people very strong words, a deceiver and an antichrist. A deceiver is somebody who is in error, who leads others astray. And an antichrist is simply, they are against Christ. Okay, verse 8. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Now you'll notice, I've got on the screen there, the first and third we are probably better read as you. Look to yourselves that you do not lose those things that we worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. Watch yourself concerning the truth. God will measure you up against his word, against the truth of his word. If you don't measure up, you're rebelling. It's very simple. But when you decide God's worth, God's word is the truth, you receive reward. The things worked for, they are the things that produced by you. Beware about not, sorry, beware that you don't follow a lie. And it says there that you will not receive a, a reward. This is not about salvation. This is about a reward that you will receive later. And this could be a reward both here on earth or a heavenly reward. If you do the wrong thing, your testimony can be destroyed. You can lose your reward here on earth. Not that we work for a reward, the labour that we do is out of love and of gratitude. If you work for a reward, then you've missed it. You've gone astray. Verse 9, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. 
whoever transgresses, so you go too far, does not abide in the truth, the doctrine of God. False teachers seem to think they are advanced thinkers. They think better than everyone else. So every other person in history who's gone before, who's read the Word of God, they think themselves as better than those people. Unfortunately, they are so advanced, they are ad advanced out of the truth of God's Word, out of following Christ, out of His doctrine, His teachings. Our aim, our aim is to abide. What's abide? Which means to stay, to continue. Continue and remain in the doctrine of Christ. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Unfortunately, when people read this, they say that Christians are unloving because we will tell people the truth, the truth first. We will say there is only one way to God and the truth separates us from everyone else. Just by saying that, we are saying we are different. People will say that we are unloving, judging, you're saying I'm a sinner, how dare you? But it's the truth. We need to draw a line. Can you imagine you go in to a, visit a doctor and he's going to tell you, you're going to live to 110. Great. Or would you prefer, sorry, you have cancer. You have six months to live. The truth hurts, right? If that was told to you, the truth hurts. If we were to say to somebody, yes, you're a sinner, it's exactly the same. The truth hurts. The Bible is based on truth. That's what we find in it. Okay, nearly there. Sorry, In verse 10 now. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. So what to do? The advice given by John to this lady and her children. Is it advice or a command? If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not command. So in the early days of Christianity, as I was saying earlier, the local chur churches didn't have pastors. It was very rare for them to have a pastor. So they would have people like the Apostle Paul, Timothy, and it was even said that some of the other apostles were traveling around at the time. They were the ones to bring, they had this memorized. If people didn't have a copy of the scriptures, they had to rely on people who had memorized the truth. And of course, there were those who were false. The culture of the day, if you accepted somebody into your house for a meal, you accepted into the house as a family member. It's a bit different to what we have today. So there is some cultural difference. So when you read this, keep in mind the cultural difference and you have to work out what that culture is for today. What is accepting somebody into your family? If I was to accept a Mormon into my house and they were to stay there long term. If I applied this, I 
in now accepting a false teacher. I am not applying God's truth. That is, to me, that's when I look at it, that's an example from today's culture. But in the culture we have for, the, for this day, just accepting them into your house for a meal, they're accepted in as a family member. You had to know the truth first before you talk to them to find out if they knew the truth. That's why you need to know God's word. For somebody to not know even the story of Joseph means they do not know the truth. How can you even know if somebody turns up your door and starts talking about this story from the Bible and they've manipulated it in some way? You cannot know if they are lying and leading you astray. Verse 11, I'm just skipping over a couple of things for being mindful of time. Uh, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So that is following that concept even further. To greet is to share and participate in what they are doing. So somebody who is sharing lies, you invite them into your house. Just be careful and the biggest thing that we need to be careful of today is what do others think so if you invite invite a mormon into your home for a meal what do others think they may not know your purpose if your purpose is to invite them in to discuss the word of god okay, that's fantastic and to win them over to Christ, yes. Others don't know that. Unfortunately, they can think the wrong thing, that you are accepting them and their doctrine. Just be careful. And it's the same, I've given the example previously, I can walk into a bar and people would see me walking out of there with nothing in my hands and think, oh, he's been in there to drink. And in fact, I've walked in there handing out gospel tracts without knowing the full story of what's going on you can actually fall away from your love relationship with that person now it's also if they see you or if I see you there oh do you want to help, help me next time <laughs> And then all of a sudden you're realizing, oh, what they're doing is sharing God's word. So always be careful when you see somebody doing something, find out what they're doing first before you make an accus accusation. So this greeting, we often use the greeting of how are you? So very Aussie and then they walk away yes <laughs> and it's oh yes I find that strange whenever you do that feeling just automatically yeah yes that's right so this is in this case it's saying it's not just how are you it's actually waiting for the response. That's what this verse is talking about. Okay, verse 12. We're getting there. Verse 12 and 13. Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so without paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Now you notice just how quickly this letter just gets cut off. So there's John was saying that, hey, I've got so many more things I want to tell you, but let's wait till I meet you face to face. Now those things could be both good and bad. Uh, there's things in this letter that are both please, do, fantastic. 
Now these are things we can apply to our own lives. When you meet a fellow believer, hey, there's times where, fantastic, keep going. Do you do it? Do we write a note? Do we just say, great effort, I saw you doing that. Thank you. But of course, if you do see somebody going against the truth, what does John say? Hey, you need to face up and you need to follow the truth. And you notice because this letter is so short, he doesn't lecture them. It is just, hey, this is it. Do it. Righto. I'll leave it with you. This lady follows Christ. For those who know Christ, you don't need to say much to them to reprimand, reprimand them. It can be just one line. Hey, do, what about this? And walk away. Leave it with them and God. That's what John did here. Just left it there. We don't know the result, but God willing, this lady and her children followed what John was saying. So simple. And we don't need to go on and on. What you do then is you lose them as a friend. If you go on and on and on and on. Step back. And of course, we don't have John's normal farewell here or a normal farewell to, that we have in a lot of the letters. It's just very short. And the children of your elect sister greet you. The sister. There are two elect ladies that we can read of in this one letter. And all she does is say, hi. <laughs> very, very simple. God's truth. God's Word. How often do we pick it up, read it, study it? And I'm sure as we've gone through this letter, there are challenges for each one of us. And I know even as I go, went through it again over this uh, last week, the Lord re-challenged me about some things. Just also, be careful of what you think of others, how you deal with them. Truth first. Find the truth first before you make an assumption. Assumptions can inevitably lead to that loss of, that showing of that grace and mercy. And I want to finish with this one verse. From Joshua 24. I'm just going to read out what's highlighted there. But it, um, it reads, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Choose you this day whom you will serve. For me and my house we will serve the Lord. And I just want to close now in a word of prayer. And during that time, I'll ask the musicians to come up. And Father, at this time, we, I know for myself, I remember, remember that time, quarter to one in the morning, where your truth sank home. The truth that you died died on that cross for me. And it's something that I remember afresh, even now, that you died for my sins, you rose and you ascended on high, and you were preparing that place, not just for me, but for every single believer. 
It is that truth that we have that we need to share with others. Help us in being able to remember, remember and remember that you have done these things, not just for us, but for all people. And please help us in being able to share this wo these words, share this truth, and to share your grace, mercy and peace with those around us. You will continue to challenge us with how much we know of your truth. And you will help us in being able to let it sink in and to be applied to our lives so that when we go out, we continue to walk in your truth. So help us now. So I ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.